So now that we've covered Kepler's laws in the lecture, we can make sure that we understand exactly what an ellipse is and what Kepler was really trying to tell us with his three laws. So hopefully we're all familiar with a circle. A circle has one single central point and that central point is defined as being just as far from every single point on that circle. And that distance from the center we could call r, or the radius. And that's something that we've seen throughout uh, middle school and high school. Now, for an ellipse, what we have is something that looks a little bit different. So it's kind of an oval shape. But the key thing is that there are two special points. Each of those points is called a focus. And so each of those two focus points, and the plural of focus is foci, are telling us that if we look at the distance between those two points and we add that up, that will be the same throughout the entire ellipse. So not quite what a radius of a circle is trying to tell us, but something similar. Now, for a circle, when we have one radius, we can tell we can use that number to tell us whether we have a small circle or a big circle. For an ellipse, we want the same kind of thing, where if we think about the full diameter of the circle, we know that the radius is half of that. And so if we take this long diameter, that's called the major axis, major axis, and half of that, in the same way that half of a diameter is a radius, half of that major axis we're going to call A, where A is the semi-major axis. And so if you look up the distance between a planet and our sun, it will often be told to you as a semi-major axis telling us something that's kind of like the radius of that orbit, but isn't quite a radius because those aren't quite circles. We also can tell how squashed an ellipse is with a certain number. And so the little E that we saw in our slides, we'll make sure that we re remember, that's eccentricity. where if we had a zero, that would be a circle. And so this shape that I've made has an eccentricity of zero. And it can go all the way up 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to one, which would pretty much be a straight line, where we've squashed the ellipse out so much that it's no longer in elliptical shape. It's just a straight line. The one that I've drawn here on the board is actually already about 0.8 or 0.9 in this range between 0 and 1. So we'll keep all of that in mind as we move forward. All right, so now we remind ourselves what we talked about for ellipses in our slides. But now let's make sure we understand how that works for our solar system. So if we draw a big ellipse here, then Kepler's first law is that rather than being in circles, planets orbit in ellipses with the sun at one focus. So the sun is at a special spot. But since we don't have a single center, we just put the sun, there's our sun, at one of these two focus points. And there's nothing at the other focus point. Now, the really important part of Kepler's laws is Kepler's second law. And that's the one that really matters to us. So Kepler's second law is 
is that planets sweep out equal areas in equal time. And that's what we want to make sure that we understand in today's deeper look. Equal areas in equal time. Okay, so let's say that we have a planet that is going around the sun, so orbiting in a nice big orbit around the sun, and we catch it at this point A, and we follow it all the way to point B. Now, when we're talking about sweeping out areas, what we're saying is an, a line that connects that planet to the sun as we follow it from point A to point B, it's sweeping out this whole area. So it's this area here that we're talking about. That if I were to color it in completely with this marker, the amount of marker that I uh, use would help us figure out how big that area is. If we then wait a long, long time until that planet is at a different part in its orbit, so it goes all the way around, and now maybe we catch it over here, at point C, and so we make that whole line all the way to point C, and we follow it as it goes around to point D. If I take the exact same amount of marker to have to shade in all of this, then this area, assuming that these two areas are the same, and so I've drawn them as close as I can sort of ballpark, but assuming these two areas are the same, equal areas, then what that means is the time it took that planet to go from point A all the way around to point B is the same amount of time it takes that planet to go from point C all the way up to point D. But one thing we notice is that that planet had to move a much bigger distance, right? When we look at the distance that it had to travel, it's going from this point all the way around to here. So a big distance. Whereas over here, it had to go a small distance. But if these things are taking exactly the same amount of time, then to cover this big distance in, let's say, a month, then we had to be moving very quickly. So that means we're moving very fast when we're close to the sun, and we're moving very slow when we're far from the sun. And so Kepler's second law can really be rewritten to be a more useful way of us thinking about it, is that planets move faster when they're close to the sun, and farther when they're and slower when they're farther from the sun. So Kepler was a mathematician, and so that was the way that he sort of thought about things, is that he was just looking for the patterns, and this equal areas and equal times is very satisfying to a mathematician. But for our purposes, when we care about what those planets are actually doing, this is the way that we're going to think about Kepler's second law. It's the same idea, but just worded in a way that helps us think about what's physically happening to these planets, rather than thinking about the math of areas and uh, distances around the curve. And before we uh, close out today's deeper look, we've got Kepler's third law that we'll mention here. Which is just an equation actually, and it's p squared equals a cubed, where p is the period of the orbit, so how long it takes, for something to go once around the sun. 
And A, just like we said right over here, is the semi-major axis. But it kind of gets us back to the same kind of idea where Kepler's second law is telling us for a single planet, when it's closer to the sun, it's moving fast, and when it's far from the sun, it's moving slow. Kepler's third law is saying the planets that are already always closer to the sun, they have a smaller semi-major axis, a smaller ellipse, will actually be moving faster all of the time than the planets that are, that are farther from the sun, which have a larger semi-major axis. So the Earth goes around faster around the sun all of the time compared to Mars or Jupiter, for example. But it still gets us back to the same kind of idea that planets move faster when they're close to the sun and slower when they're farther away. Now, I'll leave all of this up just like last time for you to copy down anything you didn't uh, get to while you were enthralled uh, with our deeper look. And I'll see you next time. Oh good, you're still here. So, one thing that we need to make sure that we understand as we think about Kepler's three laws, and we'll do the lecture tutorial on Kepler's second law, is that although we've been drawing these really wide and very eccentric ellipses, all of the planets in our solar system orbit with very, very small eccentricities, eccentricities that are very close to zero, and when we look at their orbits, it's actually very hard to tell that they aren't perfect circles. So when we draw the orbit, of the Earth around the Sun, and it almost looks like that, where there might be two tiny focus points because it isn't a perfect circle, but the Sun would be at one of them, and then the Earth would go around in almost a perfect circle. And so, although I've been doing this, and our textbook does this, and my slides do this. We're trying to make sure we understand the difference between an ellipse and a circle, since the ellipse is this new shape that we're trying to learn. But we want to make sure that the, we understand that the real orbits in our solar system are all nearly perfect circles. And we'll think about this more in the lecture tutorials. All right, I'll see you next time.